This video is sponsored by Squarespace. Compton, California, 1986. While 22-year-old Eric Wright makes a living selling drugs, he is rattled after his cousin is shot and killed. Wright decides he needs to make a career change in an industry that is a bit safer, you could say. That industry? The music industry, of course. Wright decides to become a rapper and begins recording songs in his parents' garage. He got more involved with the quickly growing Los Angeles hip-hop scene. On March 3rd, 1987, Wright met Jerry Heller who by this time had already made a name for himself managing local rappers. The two apparently got along pretty well and decided to start a record label together called Ruthless Records. Both would invest hundreds of thousands of dollars of their own money into the business. Wright had the money to spend. He apparently had earned at least $250,000 over the years from dealing drugs. One of the first people Wright wanted to work with for his new label was a dude named Andre Young. A local local DJ known to his fans as Dr. Dre. Young had already found success in the recording industry with the hip-hop group World Class Wrecking Crew, and he also regularly performed mixes for a local radio station. Through the help of a record store owner named Steve Yano, Wright was able to meet Young and convince him to start recording with him for Ruthless Records. Wright would rap, Young would produce. However, Wright knew that the more talent he could find, the better his songs would be. He reached out to another DJ named Kim Renard Nasal to help him out as well. In late 1986, Wright met a young up-and-coming rapper named O'Shea Jackson. Jackson was just 16, but had already been performing with the hip-hop group CIA. Young knew Jackson already because his cousin was also in CIA. By 1987, Jackson, who performed publicly as Ice Cube, was writing songs for Wright, who had chosen his own stage name by this point, Easy e Young and Jackson soon became a dynamic songwriting team. They wrote one particular banger for HBO, or Homeboys Only, a New York-based group Wright had signed to Ruthless Records, the song they wrote, Boys in the Hood. However, HBO, the hip-hop group, not the TV network, rejected the song. So Wright was like, fine, we'll form our own group and release it ourselves. Wright called the group NWA, which stood for, well, I'm a white dude from Kansas, so I'll just let you read it. NWA would feature not only Easy e Dr. Dre, and Ice Cube, but additionally Nasal, who went by the stage name Arabian Prince. Ruthless Records released Boys in the Hood on March 3rd, 1987, and it was soon a local hit. It became a sort of anthem for many African-American young men who grew up in the slums of Los Angeles, many of them without solid father figures in their lives. The song unsurprisingly resonated with them as they regularly dealt with gang violence, rampant drug use, and police brutality. Later that year, Ruthless Records included the song on a compilation album called N.W.A. and the Posse. The compilation, which was entirely produced by Dr. Dre, featured three official N.W.A. tracks, Eight Ball, Panic Zone, and Dope Man. While this album today is often labeled, quote, West, West Coast, Coast Hip Hop, it also signaled a brand a new genre of music that we call today, quote, gangsta rap. Outside of LA, eh, the compilation didn't really do that well. By early 1988, NWA had two additional members. DJ, rapper, and producer Antoine Caraby, whose stage name was DJ Yella, and rapper Lorenzo Patterson, whose stage name was MC Ren. Meanwhile, the group had been writing and recording a lot of new material. They were inspired to make one song based on one specific experience they had while hanging out in front of the studio they recorded at Audio Achievements in Torrance. It was later dramatized in a movie, actually. Police officers approached them and demanded they get on their knees and show IDs without any explanation. Angered by this experience, Ice Cube wrote the lyrics for a song that would become their song, The Police. 
Dr. Dre was a little nervous about producing that one, as he had served time recently in jail over numerous traffic violations. Regardless, they all ended up following through making it, and that wasn't the only provocative new song they recorded, oh no. They also recorded a song called Straight Outta Compton, which featured obscene, angry, threatening lyrics that celebrated violence and just basically talked trash the whole time. They recorded a song called Gangsta Gangsta, which bragged about about doing a drive-by shooting and dehumanizing women. You've got to understand, this was 1988. You just didn't see lyrics like this back then. It was shocking, to say the least. And that was kind of the point. MC Ren and fellow Ruthless Records rapper The DOC also helped out with lyrics, and Dr. Dre, DJ Yella, and Arabian Prince all pitched in producing using a drum machine, sampled horn blasts, funk guitar riffs, turntable scratches, and sampled vocals from old songs. I should point out that Arabian Prince had left the group before recording was complete. Dr. Dre not only produced, but rapped on several tracks. For less than $12,000, the group finished recording what would become their debut studio album, Straight Outta Compton. Named after the aforementioned song, that was the title track. Ruthless released it on August 8th, 1988, and most of the songs not only documented Compton's street violence, but seemed to encourage it. Straight out of Compton, horrified grandmas across the country. The police even got the attention of the FBI, who sent a letter to NWA warning them that they disapproved of the song's promotion of violence toward law enforcement. Afterward, NWA jokingly referred to themselves as the world's most dangerous group when promoting themselves. Many stores found Straight Outta Compton too offensive to sell, and when it was in stores, it was one of those rare albums with the new parental advisory label on it. As you might expect, Straight Outta Compton got hardly any radio airplay, as most stations were nervous to play it. In fact, some stations even banned the group from ever getting played. MTV also refused to air NWA's music video for Straight Outta Compton, also afraid it glorified violence too much, despite being extremely controversial and offensive to so many people, or perhaps because of that, Straight Outta Compton was a hit. It was the first big gangster rap album, specifically the first gangster rap album to sell more than a million copies. It went on to sell almost more than three million copies. Critics also generally praised it, mostly since it was just exciting and groundbreaking stuff. In 1989, NWA went on a national tour because of of the police, local police officers, often refused to provide security at the group's concerts. At one infamous show in Detroit, members of the group were detained by local police because they decided to perform just a few lines of the song. Meanwhile, Easy e had also released his debut solo album, Easy Does It. Ice Cube wrote most of the album. However, friction between Ice Cube and Easy e and Jerry Heller related to how Ice Cube was getting paid for his contributions ultimately led to Ice Cube leaving NWA to pursue a solo career in December 1989. Ice Cube later sued Heller for unpaid royalties, but they ended up settling that out of court. The drama caused by Ice Cube demanding more money led to many diss tracks back and forth between him and the remaining members of NWA, who released some of those diss tracks on their EP, 100 Miles and Runnin', released by Ruthless on August 14th, 1990. The music video for the EP's title track shows the remaining members of NWA in a jail cell and an Ice Cube lookalike being released. Ice Cube responded to these diss tracks with the song No Vaseline, featured on his album Death Certificate, a song that not only targeted his old group, but featured a seemingly anti-Semitic attack on Heller, who was Jewish. Jewish. For the rest of 1990 and into 1991, NWA recorded what would become their second and final studio album called Yes, That. 
Well, it was also known as e Phil for Zagan, so I'll call it that. Ruthless released it on May 28th, 1991, and this one was arguably even more provocative than Straight Outta Compton, getting another parental advisory sticker, of course. e Phil for Zagan had less original lyrics and somewhat signaled that NWA had become a parody of themselves. The lyrics were also heavier on the misogyny, and this really turned off a lot of fans and critics. Still, e Phil for Zagan demonstrated how far both Dr. Dre and DJ Yella had come as producers. By most accounts, this album just sounded better, featuring the singles Always Into Something, Appetite for Destruction, and The Days of Way Back. e Phil for Zagan sold almost a million copies its first week out and got to the top of the Billboard 200 chart. A few months later, NWA released a video called that, a behind the scenes look at making e Phil for Zagan. However, by that time, NWA was no more. They had broken up. The main cause was Dr. Dre's decision to leave the group to help start their record label, Death Row Records. But the remaining group's members, MC Ren and DJ Yella, had also begun to lose trust in Easy es true financial motives. Dr. Dre, just like Ice Cube, went on to have a ridiculously successful solo career. Easy e also went on to have a successful music career, mostly with other artists, but he tragically died from complications due to AIDS on March 26, 1995. He was only 30 years old. Though Easy had been in feuds with both Cube and Dre since NWA dissolved, before he died, he had made amends with both. In 2014, Ice Cube and Dr. Dre helped produce a movie based on the rise in fall of NWA called, you guessed it, Straight Outta Compton. That's the movie I referenced earlier. Ice Cube's son, O'Shea Jackson Jr., actually played the role of his dad in the film. Jerry Heller sued the filmmakers, though, saying he was depicted inaccurately. He also argued that parts of it were taken from his autobiography without his permission. In 2016, NWA was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and four of the surviving members, along with some of Easy es family, were there for the acceptance speech. Today, they are all still alive and recognized as the godfathers of gangsta rap music. Despite still being controversial due to their explicit lyrics and glorification of crimes, drugs, and misogyny, NWA is arguably the most influential hip-hop group of all time. They've sold more than 10 million records. They left a lasting legacy that continues to this day. They brought not just gangster rap, but all rap into the mainstream with their success, including broadening the appeal of hip-hop beyond just an African-American audience. They rewrote the rules of rap. Before NWA, no hip-hop group sounded like them. After NWA, it seemed like every hip-hop group wanted to sound like them. This video is sponsored by Squarespace. Squarespace is the all-in-one platform for building your brand and growing your business online. Stand out with a beautiful website, easily engage with your audience, and sell anything. Your products, content you create, and even your time. I tried it out recently by building a website for my band, Electric Needle Room. Here are three things I love about Squarespace. Number one, Squarespace helps me sell both digital and physical music on my site using a single interface. Number two, Squarespace easily connects with your social media accounts. You can also automatically push website content to your social media accounts so your followers can share it too. Number three, Squarespace has powerful blogging tools to share stories, photos, videos, and updates. Categorize, share, and schedule your posts to make your content work for 
for you. Head to squarespace.com slash beat goes on for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to the link in the description of this video to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. So what's your favorite NWA song? My favorite is Dope Man. I know you didn't care, but I thought I'd tell you anyway. Also, which rap group would you like to see me cover for this series next? Let me know in those comments, and thank you for watching.